We now turn back to Psalm 119 to hear God's word preached. Psalm 119, verse 57. Verse 57, Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. May God now open his word to us by the Holy Spirit as we depend entirely upon him. Lord, you are my portion. I have said that I would keep thy words. Now we move forward in this section of the psalm, seeking to understand it. And as we move into each section, it paints another uh, window pane in the whole view of the psalm that helps us understand why the whole thing uh, was written Uh, You'll remember that several times in this psalm we have seen that the Christian is a pilgrim passing through this world. And in the last uh, section, um, I, I hope you'll remember something of it, the Lord caused the psalmist to hope in affliction. Uh, The psalmist didn't just lay hold of these hopes himself from God's promises, but it is a wonderful thing to remember Um, that God can cause these inclinations in our heart when we can't create them. So when we cannot hope in our affliction, the last section told us that God can actually do that himself, that he causes us to hope in him. Now, it wasn't my intention, but we sang for uh, Psalm 65 there, and the same truth arises in that psalm, and we sang it together. It said, How blessed the one whom thou dost choose and makes approach to thee, who causes someone to approach them. So how blessed is the one whom God has chosen to be his own, and who God makes to approach him? In other words, God initiates us and makes us move towards him as a shepherd, um, makes the sheep, and instigates that with the sheep to to push and, and to prod the sheep, to make the sheep go where he wants it to go so we hope in affliction whether spiritual physical or the persecution of the world which is throughout this entire psalm it's in each section either what they say what they do in our own section now we see that bands of ill men me robbed said i but thy precepts i have not slighted so he's a pilgrim in the world in opposition territory, in enemy territory, and God causes him to hope in these spiritual uh, afflictions that are sent his way. He's an alien in a godless culture, and the pride hold him in great derision, the psalm tells us. This is a derision that's against God, his word, and Jesus Christ. And he encouraged himself by remembering God's judgments of old, and his past deliverances to his people, and comforted himself in the Lord. The last section, Zion, um, says. So that's important. There you have some, some, here are the insightful balances of the Holy Spirit, that in the very same portion, God causes us to hope in him, but as we're on the receiving end of that, as you're sitting there with your Bible, and you're praying each day, the psalm actually says, that I remembered your judgments and I comforted myself. Now, you know he doesn't mean that, that we actually just comfort ourselves. Of course, the comfort is of the Holy Spirit. But the point is, when you're low like that, you should pick up your Bible and look into what God has done and the great promises he gives. And as his Spirit moves in you to comfort you, you are active in that. You are, you are actually taking action. And in a way, you have comforted yourself. I was low and so on. So this morning, uh, when when I arose, I was reading and singing Psalm 103, and it greatly stirred my soul. 
Um, I didn't intend to sing that uh, psalm this morning myself. It was in the service, but I was drawn to the psalm, and God caused me to hope in him. Um, But I also comforted myself. Why? Because I chose to pick up the psalm and, and sing it. And so you are responsible, is the point. You can't just sit there passively saying, God, please help. You must, as you plead for his help, take up his word and the spirit and you um, working in that spiritual way, you will be comforted. Those songs and those judgments have been his songs in the house of that pilgrimage. So there you have it. He is comforted. He is a pilgrim. The wicked and the spiritually opposed are all around. It is difficult, but he he latches on to God's judgments and actions of the past and his promises to him. And these promises and songs are a comfort to him in the house of his pilgrimage. Our theme in this section, you are my portion, O Lord, I've said that I would keep your words. The theme in this section is turning back to God. Now, in, in that, it obviously implies that I'm putting to you that he had turned away in some way from God. For, for how could he turn back? But I am putting that to you from the psalm that this section from verse 57 to 64 is about turning back to God after a time of drifting or lukewarmness or failure in which he was then afflicted by God in the prior sections of the psalm to bring him back to the Lord. It may be that David wrote the psalm It may have something to do with him writing it later in life and thinking back to some of his failures um, in the Saul era, some of his failures with Absalom, uh, certainly his failure with Uriah and Bathsheba. Um, it, It may be that, but in whatever context it was written, it is clear from the words as we shall look at them now that there has been a fall or a drifting and that it was affliction that woke him up to that fact, and the Lord drew him back to him. So this is just a Christian psalm. This happens to each of us frequently. There's a very practical, spiritual psalm. So that was after a time of drifting. So the theme is returning to God. And I want to see it under four headings. Pursuing God, mending our ways, bonds of companions, and a choice inheritance. Pursuing God, mending our ways, bonds of companions, a choice inheritance. Let's see, first of all, pursuing God. Now, we'll come to the the great theme of this section, what the portion and inheritance is, uh, in a few minutes. You are my portion, Lord. But I, I want you to see in verse 58, the second verse, that he entreats the Lord for his favor with his whole heart and asks for mercy. That's what he's seeking. Mercy according to your ways. Verse 59, I thought about my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. He is seeking God. Now that's what David or any true believer will end up doing even when they've backslidden or fallen into a terrible sin as David did at points and his other of his people did. He, deep down, loves God, and he will seek him again. He opens by saying, you're my portion, O Lord. I've said that I would keep your words. That is centrally God-focused. You are my portion, not Israel, not others, not my kingdom, but you are my portion, O Lord. I entreated your favor with my whole heart. Notice, not just heart, but whole heart. It's written that way for a reason. This is the fullness and wholeheartedness of someone that is absolutely determined and full of revitalized energy to seek the Lord again. Not something that comes to us naturally, but he experiences this, I think, after a time of falling away. How do we know he had fallen away? Well, consider verse 67. It is just beyond the section we're looking at, but see what it says. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Verse 71. 
It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Now see that there? Before he was afflicted, he had gone astray from the commandments of the Lord and a spiritual seeking of him every day. Now David can do that, Paul can do it, any one of us can do it. Where we still know what we know, we're still called a Christian, we still are a Christian, but we are not as sustained and as consistent as God or Christ. So we are Christians, but we will have times where we're really seeking him and where we're going out and slaying Goliath and we're allowing Saul to slap us in the face and send soldiers after us and we hold our peace and say, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. And then 15 years later, it can be very different, very different. It's the same person, but the, the heart of the faithful Christian is not the heart of Jesus Christ. That's why we need our Savior. We are not as sustained and as consistent and strong as Jesus, who ultimately could sing psalms about faithfulness and righteousness and then be absolutely true of him. For us, these psalms describe us, but it's not the whole story. He went astray, but then he was afflicted and didn't go astray anymore. Verse 71, it was good that I was afflicted because that affliction then led me to learn your statutes and now the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold or silver. Consider throughout the entirety of the psalm how often the psalmist mentions shame, that he will not be ashamed before the wicked and he asks God to not make him ashamed. We sing many psalms like that. Psalm 25 is one of the most famous examples. My God, let me not be ashamed, nor foes triumph for me. God good and upright is the way he'll sinners show. Let not me be ashamed. Why is he saying that? Well, the psalmist, if it's David, he would have reasons to be ashamed. I would have reasons to be ashamed. So do you. Even if these sins have been forgiven. Now we fall away as followers of Christ. We drift into lukewarmness. We don't pursue him. We leave off prayer and the vitality of the word. We are not moved by the spirit. We are not understanding. We become stiff-necked. We become a bit blind. And yet we still follow him. But we're in a low, a bad, declined spiritual condition. And things occur. And then God has to afflict us in some way. And we must be ashamed in a certain way. We must feel that shame and come before our Savior to deal with it. But the psalmist at the same time says, even though that's going on between me and you, don't let the wicked shame me because of that. This is happening because I follow you, and I am imperfect and I fall. But do not let the wicked shame me. Do not, cause, do not let me be the cause for which the enemies of God shall blaspheme. But see the note of shame. You can check it in your own time, all 22 sections. How often things like shame and reputation are mentioned in this psalm, which you must attach to him going astray in a certain way and then being afflicted. And he's bringing up the subject of shame. Take the very end of the psalm, Psalm, uh, 176, the last verse of the psalm. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. So there's the psalmist. I went astray like a lost sheep. And he doesn't say, and then I sought you. He says, seek your servant, Lord. It's almost like Jesus' parable of the lost sheep. It's the shepherd that goes after the sheep, not the other way around. But if that's the last psalm, a verse, sorry, of a very uh, repetitive psalm that's all about God's word. The last verse is going to be very important. It's thematic. So the whole psalm is, I went cold on your word. I, I fell away from your word. I, I went astray and I became a bit backslidden, declined and less alive. And it had these effects on me and affected my practical decisions. It affected the power and grace with which I could act on your behalf, Lord. It affected my service as a king, or as a husband, 
or as a worker or as a minister or elder or whatever, it affected me. I, I was not as spiritually strong as I ought to be. That brought some shame in. It brought some affliction in. And now I am returning to you. Why? Because you've sought me out. You've pricked me. You've, uh, you've brought conviction to me. And you've shown me, I've come to my senses, that these things ought not to be. And I must turn back to you. So he is turning back to God. Um, now when he does so, as he pursues God, he focuses in on the truth of mercy in verse 58. Now, just notice this. You sing many psalms and read them, and you're used to words like grace and mercy, but think about the meanings here. As the one who loves the Lord and who has gone cold returns to Christ after being backslidden, he says, I entreated your favor with my whole heart, be merciful to me. So when God seeks us out in that condition, he will bring a conviction into our hearts. When we see the way we've declined, it, it's made clear to us. I, I've seen it myself many times where you realize you're in a certain position and then you check yourself against four years ago or something, and you remember the way that you worshipped or the way you shared the gospel or the way you spent your time, and you compare it and you realize there's actually a, a significant change here. This isn't good. And you become convicted. You don't come back with a sense of self-justification and say, well, that's okay because the Christian life is up and down. No, no. It concerns you and it grieves you because you look at Christ and he looks at you and says, I am still the same Christ and I have been with you and given you the ordinances and yet you have become lukewarm to me and I feel strongly for you and I have granted you many things and I have remained faithful to you but why do you love me less? Now that will hurt you if you see that in Jesus, if you know you've drifted from him, that will convict you. Like Peter, when he looked across the courtyard after denying the Lord, and it said the Lord just looked at him, and he wept bitterly. And when Peter went to meet him at the Sea of Galilee, when they had a breakfast, you see the difference in Peter's heart. That pride bubble, that declension lukewarm bubble has been burst. It's, it's gone. There's no self-justification. He's realized he's a lot less talkative when he's sitting there with Jesus. He doesn't make big claims. Jesus, and, and remember how central love is to it. Notice that Jesus says, lovest thou me? There it is. That's what it's all about. It's about our love or decline for Jesus. That's it. The Christian life actually, in, in, in a certain way, is not complicated. Lovest thou me? And Peter says, Lord... You, you know that I love you. He doesn't say, I love you. He says, you, you know the truth. And if I didn't love you, you'd know. I, I think I do love you. But I still denied you. And it wasn't because I, I had no love for you, but it was because I was a coward and I was proud. But I do love you. I do. Please forgive me. And he says, Simon, lovest thou me? Do you have affection for me? Lord, you know. You know I have affection for you. There it is. There it is. The conviction comes. It melts. It makes you realize that there has been a period in which you were proud or that you were, you were hardened towards Christ and others and that things were not right in your heart and then, the, and then the, the boil is lanced by Christ and you realize. And it hurts. It hurts to lance a boil. But in the end, it will be better. And Christ shows us. And he says, now... I entreat your grace, your favor, with my whole heart. Be merciful to me. Now, when you have declined and drifted from the Lord, um, you are coming back to a person, to Christ. It's not about picking up your confession of faith or catechism and saying, here's the 16 things 
in covetousness and adultery that I see I'm doing. And I take each one off and say, Lord, I shouldn't be doing that. Blood of Jesus, please forgive me. Are we okay? It's not as technical as that. Remember, when you are brought to conviction and you're returning to Christ and you are repenting, you are not repenting to a database of listed sins or infractions that are on a federal list of tax or moral sins that someone commits. You, you are sinning against your husband, your love, your savior. And he takes it personally. It's, there's a personal problem. And that you see how personal that is in the psalm. He, he comes to him and he doesn't just say, I went astray, but your atonement is great. Please apply it to me. He doesn't say that. I entreated your favor with my whole heart. Be merciful to me. Now, we see this in the Bible. Maybe one of the most famous places is in Hebrews 4. And you know the passage where we are told to come to the throne of grace to repent. You know that. Do you ever struggle doing that? Well, think of the words in Hebrews 4. He says that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, and that we should come then boldly to the throne of grace. Now, listen to how it's put. That we may obtain mercy and grace to help in our time of need. Now, it matters that mercy comes first there. Maybe you always go to him and say that Christ is an infinite bank of grace because of the covenant and because of what the Bible says. No, a relationship has been affected. He is a judge. He is your savior. You know him personally. God is your father. Christ is your savior and king. But you are going to a courtroom as well. And the father is the judge and Christ in one way is the judge in another way, is our advocate. But it's not about, here's my list of sins. I believe in the covenant of grace. Does that cover me? It is much more personal than that. So when you have offended the judge and you've offended your elder brother and your savior, he's not there to crush you. But you must go in there and you must acknowledge to him that for him to give you anything, there must be an announcement of mercy first. There must be. You don't deserve to be forgiven. You don't deserve to have that sin blotted out. You don't deserve for his face to change from the stern, thundering face of a judge who's displeased to one who says, Peter, I forgive you. You don't deserve it. Now, that's a, this is a big problem in the church today. Huge problem. The evangelical and now even the Reformed church. This cheap grace and a cheap Jesus who's desperate for our attention and he's in love with us and he's a boyfriend and we're his spouse and when we show up, he looks at us and says, I know you've done wrong things, but I am so taken by you. I just, no, no. Biblical theology. Christ is our judge. He is the king of kings. And he hates our sin. He hates lukewarmness and he hates our backslidings. He is great and will show grace. But he wouldn't do it if we wandered in there acting like mercy is cheap and we don't need mercy. So we come into God's throne room and we say to him, you have to forgive me. Why? You've promised in your word you will and you've said you're a gracious God. No. No, you ask for mercy. And he must bestow it. We find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. We must understand that we need mercy. What did David say in that other great psalm of repentance, Psalm 51? Have mercy on me, O Lord. In your compassions blot out my iniquity. Have mercy. Jesus must show us mercy. 
because we offend him and we sin against him. And the psalmist is right on this revived heart course here because he says it right. He doesn't just say, I am yours. He says, show me mercy according to your word. Now, when we go in for mercy, there can be several things that we're asking for mercy for, my dear friends. And any of us here might have these now. I don't know what is secret and private. It is remarkable what can happen in the life of a Christian. Some of these sins are very serious and immense. Now, all sin is serious, but there are some that are very serious and what, what the Bible would call heinous sins. All sins deserve his wrath and curse, but some are shown to be particularly weighty. And sin is aggravated by what it is we do, uh, when we do it, the dignity of the one that's done against, if it's done against many warnings from God, if it's done against the counsel of others who are warning us that if we go down this path, if it's done in stubbornness, and what David calls in Psalm 19, willful sin, which is, you actually know it's sinful and others are telling you it's sinful and you say, I'm doing this anyway. I want to do this. That is willful sin. We would say that when David took Bathsheba and then sent Uriah to the front line, that that was willful sin. He, he justified it, but he knew deep down how wrong these things were. And he was trying to save his own skin. Willful sin. David says of that sin in Psalm 51, in your sight, against you only have I sinned. In your sight, I have done this evil. So there are sins that are described that way. They are evil, they are against God, and they are done in his sight. Now, a Christian can fall into this. You can fall into a fornication or a theft or speaking unadvisedly with your lips, or swearing with oaths and curses like Peter did. You can lie as Abraham did to, in his unbelief to protect his wife in Egypt. There are sins that you fall into. The, the, the circumstances arise in your mind, and there are judgments and balances that need to be made, and there's pressure on you to make a decision and you buckle under that or you give in to your desires and you put something together and your will says, I am now taking action and you do it. And then you realize within a week or a month or someone points it out to you or it comes to your own conscience that it was evil. It was evil. Some of you may have done very heinous things. Some of you might be doing something now that's very heinous that no one else knows about. Friend, if someone who loves Christ and has drifted from him falls into a great sin and they come to their senses and the prophet comes to them as Nathan did to David and says, thou art the man and you realize you must know that Christ can show mercy to that sin. There are maybe sins you've asked forgiveness for many, many years ago, and they still bother you, that it was you that did them. And I want you to know that Christ can show mercy to that sin, to the adultery. He can show mercy. He can show mercy to Paul, who was consumed with self-righteousness and wanted to destroy Christians and blaspheme the name of Christ. And this is the one who spoke like no other of the love of Christ. Christ can forgive our sin. The sin is black and filthy, and it is very guilty, but there is a crimson blood that is of the Son of God 
that was shed at Calvary, a fountain open for sin and uncleanness. And if a sinner goes there and washes, that blood will wash them whiter than the snow. However bad the sin was, do thou with hyssop sprinkle me. I shall be cleansed so, yea, wash thou me, and I shall be whiter than the snow. John says, if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We are told there that um, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. So we ask for mercy because Jesus' atonement is so great and so deep in its atoning power. That very rich blood of the King, the blood of God, the blood of atonement, the blood of sacrifice and propitiation, the blood that is sprinkled in its red glory upon the golden ark and throne of God and sprinkled upon his law and covenant, that blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So you can come to him and say, as the psalmist does here, I entreated your favor with my whole heart. That word favor there is face. Remember when I said to you that this is personal, that your Christianity must be personal? Well, it's here in the Hebrew. This is the way the psalmists all wrote. This isn't a cold mechanical Christianity. I entreated your face, or maybe even literally your presence, because if you're before someone's face, you're in their presence. But it's the personal aspect. It's the it's the proximity to God. There's a real relationship here. So sinner, Christian, declined one, lukewarm backslider, you have lost the presence of Christ. You are not before his face. What does the Bible call that? He has hidden his face from me. And the light of his countenance, I cannot see his face. Sometimes when parents are displeased with their children, there will be times where the face is hidden. Or between a husband and wife or friends, where there is such a breach and the friends, they can't look at each other. Well, he, Jesus hides his face from us. But when we come to ourselves in our conviction and we come via his blood for mercy, I sought your face. Why? I know you're angry, Lord. But I've seen that gracious face before. I know how capable of love you are. And I acknowledge your anger to me. You are right to be angry with me, Lord. I've fallen by the wayside and given myself over to the world in sin. But I come to you knowing, as uh, William Cowper said in his poem about God, that behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Behind the sternness of Christ towards his people when he must be displeased, there is a love. Isn't that there when, when you sternly rebuke your children? Behind the... The frowning displeasure, is there not a burning love? Yes, that arises in that moment in anger against the sin. But there is love there. And once it's dealt with, there can be a reconciliation and the showing of a gracious face. I entreated your face and your presence with my whole heart. Not lukewarm anymore, not half-hearted. If you're fallen away, and you've lost his face and his gracious presence. You cannot come in here every week not dealing with that sin, acting in a flippant way as though those sins don't matter, and say, Jesus is bound to love me because his covenant makes him do it. Jesus wouldn't do what his covenant makes him do. It's his covenant. And if you're coming in here having professed him, and you're saying, I don't need his presence, I don't need with my whole heart to turn towards him. I can still be safe as a Christian with the security of the gospel and just give myself to the world and my lack sins. No, it won't do, my friend. It will not do. Someone who's doing that has no business saying that they love the face of Christ. He will not put up with anyone 
who gives themselves over to a life of sin and backsliding and lukewarmness, he will not. He will not. You will find that that backsliding will become permanent and all your trust in your connection to him was in vain because it will turn out there had been no connection there. No one who loves the Lord can do that and remain in it and go back like a dog to its vomit in this way and reject the demands of Jesus' holiness and still think that the gospel is saving them. No one who's living in sin has any right to think that the gospel is saving them. If you're in that condition, you cannot half-heartedly play around with your return to him or you might find out that there is no return and that ship has sailed. No, the moment you know there's a problem between you and Christ, you seek his face with your whole heart. And I'm just telling you in his own name and by his words, not my own, that the one that does that is going to find his mercy and love in abundance. Turn from your sin, friend, because you have fallen away and been astray like this psalmist. So we pursue God. Secondly, he mends his ways. Verse 59, I thought about my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. The way, as you know, is the person's conduct and manner of life, their spiritual habits, the, the way that they pray, the way they think about God, their desire for worship. All of these are our ways. The way we feel about others and the way we love them or don't love them. Just the, the measure of our life and manner of our life. That is our way. And when he had gone astray like a lost sheep, he'd gone out of the way. And we must understand that the mercy of verse 58 always immediately leads to the fresh holiness of verse 59. The one always leads to another. Repentance and turning from sin gives a renewed forgiveness, a reconciliation with the Lord, in which Paul says we now walk in newness of life, he calls it in Romans 6. So we have been set free from the bondage of sin and we walk in newness of life. We walk in a way. You remember Jesus put it that way, that there is a way that leads to life and a way that leads to death. That is his way that is built with the things he has said. Whoever does these sayings of mine shall be like the man who walks on this way. Whoever does not do my sayings, he says, like the backslider I just spoke about in the last point, who still claims the gospel, Jesus says, if he does not put into practice the things I have said, he is on a road to destruction, even if he's carrying a Bible in his hand. There is a way to life, the way of Christ's holiness. So repentance leads to fresh obedience and holiness. We were raised from death that we would walk in newness of life. And you'll see the language of turning here. Our, the prior minister of the congregation spoke much in, in, in his series on backsliding about the concept of turning, uh, which is what the word repentance means. Well, see it here. I thought about my ways, verse 59, and turned my feet toward your testimonies. I made haste and did not delay. That He's going in this direction. In in verse 37 of this psalm, that's another section, let me read it to you. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me now in your way. Verse 9 of this psalm, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. The whole psalm's theme actually is returning to God and walking in the way. Listen to how this entire amazing psalm opens. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. 
With my whole heart I sought you, let me not wander from your commandments. Now you might read the psalm and say, a very righteous man wrote this psalm. And I love singing it because I'm very righteous myself. Let's sing Psalm 119 as reformed people and thunder out, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law. Now there is a way in which we do that, that is true. But let me caution you when you sing psalms like this. Psalm 24, Psalm 15. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? The one who keeps his law. And you're singing that going, that's me. Because the lost really break his law, but I walk in the ways of the Lord. It's true, there is a way in which the Christian is walking according to God's commandments. There is a way in which that's true. Because we are trying to guide our entire life and live in obedience. But let's be clear here. When the psalmist wrote this psalm and started the psalm with, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk according to the law of the Lord, he already knows that he's ending the psalm with, I was a lost sheep who went astray. And before I was afflicted, I went astray and I did not keep your law. So what is the opening of the psalm about? He's coming in Torah fashion to the Jews on the word of God and the revived heart. And he's saying to them, that when you fall away from God and your heart drifts from him and you backslide, you become defiled and you must seek him with your whole heart and be cleansed by his mercy and then walk in his way which is undefiled. This is a mercy redemptive walking in a way that's undefiled. It's not about that I'm righteous. I'm not, not, not in that way. Only Jesus walked undefiled in the way. But when you go to him with a collection of sins in your hand and say, I need rid of these. These need out of my life now. They have made me backslidden for two years. I need rid of these sins. God says, well, walk with me. We'll get rid of these sins. And now you walk in my way. Don't return to these things. I will revive your heart in the way. Now you must walk in that way. Friend, you must walk in that way. You must be afraid to sin against Jesus. You must walk in that way. So he is mending his ways. He's thinking about his ways and he's turning from those sinful ways because now in God's mercy, he's been forgiven and he wants to walk in the way of God, in the way of Jesus Christ and not be unnecessarily defiled. Now, when it says... He turned his feet to that right way. He said he thought about his ways. Now, how important that is. So I gave you an example of that a few minutes ago when I said, well, four years ago I was this and now I'm this. What do you do? You compare. You think about it. You can't just forge ahead and say the only way is up and um, I just am what I am. No, assess. 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 Isn't it God who says, I remember the love of your espousals? In your youth, when you were holiness to the Lord, but now you've hewn out cisterns that can hold no water. Jesus remembers the love of our youthful espousals. So you must consider your ways. Do I have the same love or an increased love for the Lord? I thought about my ways. King Jotham came after David and was a good king of Judah that had some faults. It says he did well and pleased the Lord, and he did some things to the temple and refortified the city and is commended for it, but it says he did not remove the high places. But overall, God commends him. And it says one of the things he did when he became king was he prepared his ways before the Lord. So that was when he was 25 years old when he became king. He prepared his ways before the Lord. That gives you the idea that he, he's assessed this. He's thought about his spiritual condition. He's thought about what the way of obedience looks like. For him, it was, I'm a king. What will I do with the temple? What will I do with God's law in the city of Jerusalem? For you, it is, I'm a believer, and this is how long I've been a believer. This is my marriage. This is my work. Uh, this is my spiritual condition. These are my children. This is my role in the church. Consider your ways. The prophet Malachi tells us that. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You need to think about it. You need to stop. You have sown much, but you bring in little. Oh, but does that not mean I'm being obedient? And that 
Well, God will bring the fruit if he wants to. No, consider your ways. God says, you sow much, but you bring in little spiritually. Ye eat, but don't have enough. You drink, but are not filled. <clears throat> Ye clothe, but there is no one warm. And he that earns wages, earns wages to put it in a bag full of holes. What's God's advice? Consider your ways. Thus says the Lord, he says again, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain, bring the wood, and build the house, God says. And I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified. What was the problem? They were not building God's house, but God says each man went to his own house. And they're called there to consider their ways. So we have things in our life, and it's good to have nice things, and it's good to build up our own portfolios and situations and so on, but it's nothing compared to the kingdom of Christ. Go to the mountain, bring the wood. Ye looked for much, and lo, it was little. When you brought it home, I blew upon it. Oh, yes, yes. We have a promotion. We're branching out, and we have more money, and we're going to build this extension on our home and invest in these things, or whatever it might be. We all have this tendency and it's in our hands, and we think, well, I have it now. Surely it will it will bring forth good. No, all God needs to do is blow up on it, and the thing that you earned will evaporate. These are, these are just solemn thoughts. Why did God do it? He says it here in his own words. He says to Malachi, Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because my house is in waste, and ye run every man to his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from Jew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. That's covenant theology. That's the law of Moses in Deuteronomy. It's the prayer of Solomon at the temple. That when we don't seek the Lord and put his kingdom first, we will fail against our enemies, our armies will go out and lose, our our, our children will be diseased, uh, the heavens will be as brass, the rain won't fall, and the fruit won't bring forth the fruit of faithfulness and glory. That when we are idolaters and not seeking Christ and we backslide, God will switch off all the spiritual conduits at which he's blessing us. And then we realize the ground's a bit hard, or I, I don't feel heard when I pray. Or why are there so many providential difficulties in my family right now? And God says, well, you run every man to your own house, but my house is not as important. My gospel, my covenant, my prayer time together, praise, seeking the Lord, seeking revival. Well, if you weren't asking me, if you weren't coming together to pray to me and ask for heaven to be open to pour out blessing on you, then why do you expect it to happen? You neglect that, I will shut up the heaven. Then you're surprised when the blessing doesn't fall on your own little house. Well, if you're not going to ask me to bless my house, your house certainly isn't going to get blessed. Consider your ways. I thought about my ways, he said, and turned my feet to your testimonies. I made haste and did not delay. No time for hanging around and putting together a five-year assessment program. Oh, no. No, no. Where are we at? Where's my house at and where's your house at? Where is our church at? Where is our personal faith and seeking of Christ at? Each of us must ask that question very frequently, and we must seek the Lord, his mercy, and seek his face. We're sinful people. We do get a lot of things wrong. We do. So... Pursue God and mend your ways. Third, bonds of companions, verse 61. The cords of the wicked have bound me, but I have not forgotten your law. The cords of the wicked. In verse 61, he says the wicked are around him. In verse 62, he says he rises at midnight alone. And in verse 63, he says, I'm a companion of all those who fear you. What's he speaking about? He's speaking about the company he keeps. We are social creatures and relational creatures. None of us wants to be alone. And there are people around us in work. We have a family and an extended family. We have a neighborhood. 
We have churches we're involved in. We are brothers and sisters in Christ in this place. And these things have a dynamic effect on us. He is attacked, he says, by the world, the flesh, and the devil. The cords of the wicked have surrounded me, or it can mean in the Hebrew too that a band of men actually robbed me. Whichever one it is right now, it doesn't matter. He was bound by them. He was kidnapped, either actually or spiritually. The cords of the wicked surround me. It has the idea of a rope being pulled around your neck. He's constricted by them. Why? We sang it in one of the Psalms. Save me from strife of tongues. You're in an office, or you're, you're watching the television, or you're seeking to spend time with extended family, and some of them aren't Christian or whatever, and you're constantly bombarded by either bad language or respectable language that's just completely worldly. So you go into these places, and you're thinking about Christ and seeking him and pouring out your spike and art upon Jesus and living for him and going to heaven and the lostness of souls going to hell, and you walk into company and it's peanuts and chicken wings and football. And that's it. And there's a sign on the door that's implied, if not written, that says no gospel welcome here. Don't bring up anything serious here. Don't bring up heaven and hell here. Don't bring up right and wrong here. And you would expect that as a Christian just to pander to this worldliness and to be a Roman rather than a Christian. To be there at the Colosseum, eating your peanuts and glorying in the legs of a man and glorying in the festivals of humanism. That has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. However much the players go out and say their little prayer before the game or whatever, most of these things are on the Lord's Day. These aren't spiritual things. Christians in the past, in the book of Acts, do you think they were going down to the Colosseum and going, let's go and enjoy the game? No, they were together. They were breaking bread together. They were planting churches, spreading the kingdom and discussing the things of the Lord. And the rooms that they met in were shaken by the wind of the Holy Spirit. The church. Now you're a Christian. Pastor Rump preached this. I am a stranger on the earth. And you are foreign to its culture. You speak a different language. You're a different nationality. You are not, you do not belong here. And the wicked, it, it can eat against you. Their morals, their false religion, their idols, the things they lust after, the superficialities that they drown the nation in. And you can barely get your head above the pile of superficiality for anything meaningful to be said. The wicked are around me. And it's like cords wrapping me up. The world, the flesh, and the devil. What does he do? Well, he is not just surrounded by them. He is alone. He's alone. I didn't forget your law when they surrounded me. I was like Christ surrounded by the unbelievers. I was like Paul surrounded by the Athenians. They tried to lukewarm me and they tried to bring down the height of my spiritual apprehensions and desires and say, just compromise with us and love what we love. And we say no. And what does that mean? We end up alone. Look, at midnight I will rise to praise you because of your righteous judgments. So he ends up in bed alone at midnight. Whether he's a farmer or a king, people in those days would wake up in the middle of the night and go to bed at seven like the Amish still do today. You sleep until 11 and then you wake up at midnight or one and you actually go out and feed the animals and even have a meal and so on. He's saying that when the shepherd and these people wake up, they are going to praise God whenever they're awake. He's alone at midnight and he's not with the bands of the wicked he keeps his law, and at midnight, I will rise to seek you, as I said in the prior verses, to seek your face and presence, because I know it can be found. Sometimes it's best at that time. Out he goes at night, and he looks up at the stars and sees the promises of Abraham above him, and he, and he knows that Jesus is over the cosmos, and he says, Lord, I seek you. I'm alone. It's quiet. It's nighttime. And the wicked in their coliseums are lusting after the flesh. But I seek you and your way. Show yourself to me, Lord. Do that, friend. Seek him. 
You will find them. Rise at midnight. On verse 63, I'm companion. I'm closing here. I am companion of all those who fear you. There are bands of the wicked. There's the, the lonely prayer between the believer and the great God all by himself. As though, as William Mobilfor said, he was the only penitent who was calling upon God at that time. Rise at midnight. Seek God as though you're the only one on earth seeking him. He can be yours. It's, you, you don't have to settle for, I have 5% of God as part of my corporate church. He is your God. You want to meet him? He will meet you. But he also has companions in verse 63. I am a companion to those who fear you and those who keep your precepts. When someone has backslidden and they're returning to God, one of the things that happens is they separate themselves from other Christians. Now they have to get themselves with Christians. We're here every week. I am a companion to all who fear and obey you. And we are together. The backslidden person must come back and make sure they're surrounded by Christians. Uh, why? Because the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And like any good lion and predator, he watches the pack. And he looks for weakness or one that's straggling behind or that's easier to pick off. And he looks and he watches until he can strike. And before the rest of the pack know what has happened, he snatches it and it's gone. The devil wants people to be alone and backslidden and drifting from the church and not in worship and not sensitive to Christ's holiness and not wanting to follow him. You can be here right now and think, that your profession covers these things, that people don't know that you've gone cold in your heart and that you've really drifted from Christ. And you can say, well, I still come to church, I'll be fine. No, the devil can see. He can see. And he'll pick you off. He's not messing around. Satan. Lucifer. He will destroy you. Where's the place of safety? in Christ's church that has a wall of fire around it and that is he's magnified his love in a city fortified, right? The church of Jesus Christ, all things being equal, is a place where companionship happens, where we say, your people shall be my people, your God, my God. So be with one another. How many times the apostles say, love one another, forgive one another, be kindly affectionate to one another, Pray for one another. Exhort one another. Love one another. Spend time with one another. One another, one another, one another. The bride is a corporate bride. And you as a sheep must be safe in the flock. Be there for one another and watch out for one another. The church is not a social club where we just catch up on our worldly things and what's going on with our houses or whatever. That's not what it's about. That won't protect you from Satan. The church is a place where I come to you and I say, how is your soul? And you say to me, how is your soul? And we share Christ together and we pray together and we put on spiritual armor together. Why? We're in a battle. This isn't just about sharing what happened to one another this week. It's a primarily spiritual relationship. Just remember that. Pull that thread. You're smart people. Pull that thread and seek out God's word in that area. It is primarily a spiritual family we are, and it is spiritual defenses we must have, not natural ones. So run with that. So there are the bonds of companions. He pursues God, he mends his ways, and there are bonds of companions. The backslidden person must get back into the flock. He must. Lastly, there's a choice inheritance. He says in those last verses, Lord... The earth is full of your covenant love, of your mercy. Teach me your statutes. It's full of your mercy and has said your covenant eternal love. And he's focusing on God's love there because he's overwhelmed by it. He had sinned. He doesn't deserve to be brought back. He doesn't deserve all these blessings. But he was brought back. And he says, Lord, the earth is full of your mercy. You're even good to those who hate you. You're even good to the pagan. You send sunshine on them. You bless them with rain. You give them families and marriages. 
You speak to them from the general revelation and call them a repentance. You, these are your enemies and you're so good to them. And to me, Lord, you brought me back and I can see the love of Christ. Your mercy fills the earth. Now, what does he say? We tie it with the first verse as we close here. He is focused on the mercy that is personally shown to him by the Savior. And he had said in the first verse, You are my inheritance, O Lord. I've said I would keep your word. Now that sums up this portion. You are my inheritance, and the earth is full of your mercy. I am seeking your face. God is his inheritance. Now you know the gospel gives us an inheritance. Abraham knew it too. And Israel thought that the the inheritance was just the land. They still do. They're still going on about the land today. But Abraham knew that that land represented something. Heaven. And the new heavens and the new earth. Something spiritual. A land flowing with milk and honey. A heavenly land. With heavenly rivers. And heavenly honey. That it was a picture of glory. And inheriting the earth in Jesus Christ. So that's our inheritance in a way. And it's good that that's our inheritance. We know with Abraham that we shall be heirs of the world. What an inheritance to think about. Soon, this entire earth will be Christ glorifying and be perfected, and we will reign over it with Jesus Christ. Not a small thought, but it's bigger than that. It's not the earth that's his inheritance. What does he say is his inheritance? God. Now, you can inherit many things. A big bounty. Ten million dollars. Your grandmother's house. Or a house an estate and a vineyard in Australia that an aunt left and no one else is claiming it. And you'd come in here and say, Pastor Gunn, the Lord has blessed me this week. What will I do with this provision God has given? What a wonderful thing I've been given. A vineyard and a big house and with all these provisions, I can use this business for the Lord and so on. And you would be really moved by it. You'd even talk about it. Oh, my friend, it'll all be burned up. You have something greater than that that you didn't mention to me when you saw me coming in today. You are inheriting God, not $10 million. God. What does that mean? God has given himself to you in his will. Wow. He's given himself. We are co-heirs, Paul says. Of what? We are heirs with Christ. Of what? Heirs of God. Levites, you don't get portions of land in Israel. Why? I am your inheritance, saith the Lord. So when he says, the Lord is my portion, he's saying, I don't just return to him now in my walk of faith. He is mine. He's mine. He belongs to me. He has given himself to me. See, when sin goes and guilt goes and forgiveness works and you're reconciled, see the faith and the confidence come back. You can't see that before. Does he love me? He's hidden his face from me. Was I ever saved? The sin is all blotted out. Then the Christian saying something different. What is he saying? You are mine. You're mine and one day we will relate and there will be no sin in me. You are mine and I know the Father has given himself to me The Son has given himself to me and the Holy Spirit has been given to me never to leave me. You have inherited God. Bill Gates has nothing on you. You have inherited the mighty, eternal God. O Lord, You are my portion, and Jesus Christ is mine, and I won't leave his pure, undefiled way. I'll walk with him and keep my feet unstained. Why? Because he is mine, and there's nothing greater to live for. Children, as I close this, I'm calling to your parents to know what they have. I want you to know that there's many things you might desire in this life. You'll learn like I did. They're not worth it. And that there's only one thing that's worth having. And that is that you can be given Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. 
and be given God to be your God. There is nothing that compares to it. May God impress these things on our hearts. Let us pray. Let's stand.